welcome age of vintage society. An alluring blonde with a husky come hither voice, Elizabeth Scott was a leading lady of film noir during the genre's peak years in the late 1940s and early 1950s, but scandal drove her from the public eye after only a few years on screen. Why was Elizabeth Scott's $2.5 million lawsuit revolutionary? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Elizabeth Scott, the Queen of Film Noir The Threat of Hollywood, Elizabeth Scott Elizabeth Scott, a sultry blonde with a come-hither voice, cut out for the seething romantic and homicidal passions of Hollywood film noir roles in the late 1940s and early 50s, she was billed as another Lauren Bacall or Veronica Lake, and in many of her 22 films she portrayed a good bad girl with love in her head and larceny in her heart, or vice versa. Scott's co-stars were Humphrey Bogart, Kirk Douglas, Burt Lancaster and other tough gents, and the titles of her movies were lurid stuff. The Strange Love of Martha Ivers, Dead Reckoning, Pitfall, Dark City, I Walk Alone, Bad for Each Other. Publicity departments of the golden era of Hollywood often saddled their actors with nicknames from the It Girl, Clara Bow, and Oomph Girl, Anne Sheridan, to the Lavender Blonde, Kim Novak. Scott was nicknamed The Threat as she was threatening to The Body, Marie MacDonald. In the mid-1940s, Paramount described their latest star signing, Elizabeth Scott, as beautiful, blonde, aloof and alluring, and in anticipation of her becoming another tough girl siren of the period, nicknamed her The Threat. However, during her 12-year film career, the critics and public never saw her as a threat to the two other noirish dames she most resembled, Lauren Bacall and Veronica Lake. Although they rarely played duplicitous dames as Scott did. Only later, some years after her career was in tatters, was she appreciated for being her own woman. Scott was strong and sultry, her heavy dark eyebrows contrasting with her blonde hair. Like Bacall, she had a low and husky voice, but she was far harder. In fact, she was able to suggest hidden depths of depravity, the ideal femme fatale of the 1940s. As Burt Lancaster says to her in I Walk Alone, What a fool guy I am, thinking just because you're good to look at, you'd be good all the way through. She usually played a mysterious blonde that was up to no good, promoted by Paramount as a femme fatale in the Lauren Bacall or Veronica Lake mould, her career never matched theirs in regard to role or project, but she proved herself to be a capable scene-stealer and eye-pleasing presence in thrillers like The Racket. Tabloid allegations left her star tarnished in the mid-1950s, and she vanished from the screen for the next half-century, save for an appearance in 1972's Pulp. Though largely forgotten by the general public, her steamy presence made her a favourite among armchair detectives and other fans of classic film noir. When you say ambition to me, that's when you get me started, Scott was widely quoted as saying. My greatest ambition is to be the whoppingest best actress in Hollywood. You can't blame a girl for trying. I don't want to be classed as a personality, something to stare at. I want to have my talents respected, not only by the public, but by myself. She was born Emma Matzo on September 29, 1922 in Scranton, Pennsylvania, one of six children of Ukrainian immigrant John Matzo and wife Mary Pennock, who owned a grocery store. Her mother wanted to become a journalist, but the teenage Scott was adamant she would become an actress, or a nun. When her mother heard that, she relented. She attended Marywood Seminary, a local Catholic girls' high school, but transferred to Scranton Central High School. After graduation, she spent the summer working with the May Desmond Players, a stock company in the nearby town of Newfoundland. That autumn, she enrolled at Marywood College, but quit after six months against her parents' wishes. 
Scott moved to New York and attended the Albion School of Theatre. Soon after her 21st birthday, she adopted her stage name, believing she needed something more attention-grabbing. She took the stage name of Elizabeth Scott and landed a small role with the touring company of the stage hit Hell's a Poppin, where she had little to do except to appear between sketches in stunning gowns in a series of comedy blackouts. After the tour concluded, she returned to New York in 1942. Unable to get an acting job, she was hired as a fashion model by Harper's Bazaar at $25 an hour. Later that year, Broadway producer Michael Meyerberg cast her in a small role in Thornton Wilder's The Skin of Our Teeth. In 1942, Scott was the understudy for Tallulah Bankhead in the Broadway production, but had no chance to substitute. She eventually played the lead in the play's Boston run and won rave reviews that led to Hollywood screen tests and a Paramount contract. When Bankhead left the show in 1943, Scott hoped to replace her as star, but the role was given instead to Miriam Hopkins and Scott returned to modelling. Later in 1943, when she was modelling after leaving the play, Warner Brothers producer Hal B. Wallace spotted her at her 21st birthday party held at the Stork Club in New York. Wallace scheduled an interview with Scott the following day, but she cancelled it when a telegram asked her to replace Hopkins. But when Gladys George, who replaced Hopkins, became ill, Scott was called back to the show and won rave reviews. She later played the lead in the play's Boston run, also to rave reviews and good business. In 1944, agent Charles K. Feldman, who saw her photos in Harper's Bazaar, invited Scott to Los Angeles. After failed screen tests at Universal International and Warner Brothers, Scott again ran into Wallace, who told her that he would hire her if he had the power to do so. She thought he was jerking her around and left for New York. But Wallace left Warner Brothers and formed his own production company, which would release their product through Paramount. Her debut film was the Ayn Rand scripted You Came Along in 1945, in a role originally intended for Barbara Stanwyck. Scott played US Treasury flack Ivy Hotchkiss, whose job was to look after three pilots on a patriotic bond-selling tour. When Paramount signed her, the studio described her as beautiful, blonde, aloof and alluring. Their plans were to cast her in the mould of Lauren Bacall and Veronica Lake, two other blonde dames of noir. But critics and the public never saw her as being in the same league with Bacall and Lake. She was seen as more of a generic imitation. It wasn't until years after her career flamed out that she was seen and appreciated for bringing something original to the hard-boiled characters she often played. She was known as one of film noir's archetypal femmes. Scott excelled in playing beautiful but duplicitous women who ensnare the disillusioned men who populated film noir, a genre of dark-themed American crime and detective movies popular during the 1940s and 50s that reflected society's insecurities during and after World War II. Scott physically resembled Bacall and even appeared opposite Bacall's husband Bogart in the 1947 film noir entry Dead Reckoning about a military veteran who encounters her in his quest to solve his war buddy's murder. Though Scott could sing, she rarely or never was able to sing in any of her 21 films from 1945 to 1957. While she was compared to Lauren Bacall often and didn't have McDonald's figure, she could sing. Her health also contributed, for in 1949 she collapsed in hysterics during the filming of RKO's The Big Steel with Mitchum. Her illness was such that she had to quit the film. The doctors prescribed rest. By July 1949, Scott was sufficiently recovered to star in the Princeton Drama Festival's production of Philip Jordan's Anna Lucasta. She also legalised her stage name. Her films in the 50s were a mediocre lot, attributed in large part to her falling star. Scott's last picture for Paramount was 1953's Bad for Each Other, a drama set in Scott's home state of Pennsylvania. The film was a box office failure and ended not only her Paramount contract, but also her professional and personal relationship with Wallace. Scott was now a freelancer, 
going on to make a Western noir titled Silver Load in 1954, and the JD drama The Weapon in 1956. She also attended USC where she audited courses in political science and philosophy and began investing in real estate. Her film career was further damaged, perhaps fatally, by an innuendo-laced 1954 article in Confidential magazine suggesting that she was a lesbian. Confidential was the premier scandal sheet of its day. There were others such as Hush Hush, but Confidential was the most popular by far. Bogart said of it, everybody reads it, but they say the cook brought it into the house. The magazine developed a network of call girls, waiters, bellboys, journalists, private detectives and even minor actors who would provide small bits of fact about celebrities. The magazine then elaborated on the facts, magnifying them with a great deal of innuendo, marked by the frequent use of puns and alliteration. Instead of stating outright that an actor had participated in a scandalous act, Confidential operated by suggesting that something scandalous has occurred, because the stories contained a kernel of actual truth and could be attributed to reliable sources, for a time celebrities would be unlikely to sue the publication, if only because of fear of further revelations that would come out at trial. For those who found themselves splashed over the front pages, the advice was to wait it out until the scandal died down. In September 1954, Confidential ran a story titled Why Was Elizabeth Scott's Name in the Cool Girl's Black Book? A police raid on a Hollywood bordello in 1954 uncovered some interesting evidence. A little black book seized on the premises contained one entry under S that astounded the vice officers. Scott, Elizabeth, 4, H O two double O six four B R two six double one one. According to the article, the cops could scarcely believe their eyes. The magazine went on to state that when the cops questioned the older girls, all they said was, we don't want to get anyone in trouble. But then the article noted that one of the three girls arrested, a juvenile of 17, cracked enough to convince the cops that their first suspicions were right. Supposedly the cops called the number listed in the book, only to have Scott answering with her famous husky drawl giving her away. To this little nugget was added a myriad of suggestion and supposition. Liz, the article stated, was a strange girl even for Hollywood, and for the moment she arrived in the cinema city she never married, never even got close to the altar. Her movie career went off like a rocket with such hits as You Came Along, The Strange Love of Martha Ivers, and Dead Reckoning, but faded just as quickly. Liz had few friends and never went out of her way to make new ones, but now, according to the article, she was taking up almost exclusively with Hollywood's weird society of baritone babes. Scott sued for $2.5 million, contending it had portrayed her in a vicious, slanderous and indecent manner. The outcome was never made public, but the lawsuit, filed in 1955, was believed to have been settled out of court for an undisclosed sum. The scandal, however, was nearly ruinous. She made two more unremarkable films in the 50s, then turned to singing, recording for RCA Records. The truth about Scott was that she was a non-conformist to the core. Off-screen she was fairly open about her life, loved wearing shirts and slacks, and unlike many other stars rumoured to be homosexual, she refused the services of a studio-provided beard husband. When Scott saw the article, she was furious, but instead of merely sitting by and waiting for the storm to blow over, she enlisted the services of lawyer to the stars Jerry Geisler and sued the magazine for $2.5 million, accusing it of holding the plaintiff up to contempt and ridicule and implying, in the eyes of every reader, indecent, unnatural and illegal conduct in her private and public life. However, it is important to note that she did not sue the magazine for implying that she was homosexual, but rather for its allegations that she used the services of call girls. The outcome of the trial was never made public. Some reports state the suit was settled out of court, while others maintain Scott lost on a technicality. One of Scott's problems was that, despite appearing in nine films from 1946 to 1949, 
she failed to achieve the level of stardom and clout necessary to maintain popularity at the box office. There were also television appearances on game shows and occasionally on drama series including Studio 57, The 20th Century Fox Hour and Adventures in Paradise. She appeared in her last film, Pulp, with Michael Caine and Mickey Rooney in 1972. Her film career all but ended after she starred opposite Elvis Presley in Loving You, the rocker's second film. Scott made only one more film appearance alongside Michael Caine and Mickey Rooney in the 1972 comedy thriller Pulp. In her later years, Scott led a quiet, largely private life. She helped raise funds for museums, art galleries and charities, including haemophilia research and hunger, and turned down many requests for interviews and guest appearances. While her fame faded with time, she was recognised as one of the most important and prolific film noir actresses. Asked in a 1996 interview why film noir had become so popular, Scott said, The films that I had seen growing up were always boy meets girl, boy ends up marrying girl, and they go off into the sunset, she said. And suddenly, in the 1940s, psychology was taking a grasp on society in America. That's when they got into these psychological, emotional things that people feel. That was the feeling of film noir. It was a new realm, something very exciting, because you were coming closer and closer to reality. And though her heyday lasted only about a decade, her influence remains, fueled as much by her private life as by the femme fatales she played on screen. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Elizabeth Scott? She was striking, talented and unjustly undervalued, and underemployed in Hollywood, where she was viciously smeared.